and welcome to the Vermillion Local School District Board of Education regular meeting of Monday, November 11, Everybody that has a cell phone or a laptop or any type of device, if you can log in to www.kahoot.it and then type in that PIN number Guess which one you think is the correct answer. districts and 30 percent said we pay uh, the same so we took a poll here we ran an average house value and uh, I compared it to and I'll go through the list here Lorraine and I'll go with in order so the ones that pay the highest property taxes are the lowest property taxes Lorraine is the highest followed by Perkins Sandusky Western Reserve Midview Amherst Margareta Norwalk Edison Firelands, Huron, and Vermilion. So out of all those districts, Vermilion actually pays the least amount of property taxes uh, compared to everybody else. The range is the highest. So poll number two here is, when is our renewal levy? Spring of 2020, fall of 2020, spring of 2021, or never? So everybody went quick. We got 20% saying in the spring, 20% in the fall, 10% saying never, and 50% in 2021. 
a little bit of a trick question. We, our renewal levy was last passed March 15th of 2016, and it passed with 65% of the vote. Um, so we'll have ballot language in either November of 2020 or in spring of 2021. Most likely look for it though in November of 2020. Next question, a renewal levy increases my property taxes. Red is true, blue is false, and gold is maybe. <laughs> false, 90%, 10% said maybe, so that's correct. Um, Effectively, like House Bill 920, uh, it freezes all voted real estate millage at the dollar amount collected the first year the levy passed. So as property values rise, House Bill 920 reduces your effective millage rate uh, to continue collecting the same it did the year it was passed. Um, some may pay more in property taxes, some homes may pay a little bit less, but the school collects the exact same amount. And the last question here, how much revenue does our renewal levy generate? Is it less than 10% of our budget? 15 to 10, or 10 to 15%, 15 to 20, more than 20% of our operating budget. So we got 33% between 10 and 15, 44 between 15 and 20, and 22% uh, more than 20%. The answer, um, actually, it's the gold one right there. It's uh, the renewal is for 4.2 million dollars, which is 17.9% of our operating budget. Thanks for taking part, and get on to the more important things here. <laughs> Who's your 
Miss Frank and Miss Y. And what do you want to do when you grow up? <coughs> a vet. Thank you. <coughs> My name is Brody. I'm in second grade. My teacher is Miss Gonzalez, and I would like to be an entomologist when I grow up. Very nice. Does everybody know what that is? No. Do you want to tell them, Brody? What is that? Um, the, the guy who studies like bugs. Bugs, that's right. Very good, very good. All right, that's everybody, correct? Yeah. Okay, now you guys, if everyone will please rise and join us in the Pledge of Allegiance. And then at the end of we'll, uh, the pledge, we will have a moment of silence to honor our veterans. Guys ready? Get started. Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Number six, legislative report. Um, you're going to be excited about this. Um, not a whole lot going on with that either, but I did find a couple of things that I thought were interesting just getting how much we've talked about reading lately and the importance of the basic fundamental reading skill. Um, there were two bills that were being heard by the Senate Education Committee. One of them is Senate Bill 102. Um, it's to establish a screening program for dyslexia in public schools and provide intervention services. Um, this would basically where districts would be required to screen all students at least once prior to entering first grade or upon entering the district if they had not been screened previously. School would then be required to provide intervention to the at-risk students and those with dyslexia and provide reassessments to see if interventions were effective. This is being built upon, I think it was House Bill 96 or something, where they had done a little pilot study with a handful of schools before that implemented this, and they found that the, the at-risk students just thrived really significantly by implementing something like this. So that's kind of where that's coming from. And then the other one was Senate Bill 200, which is also about um, the dyslexia, which would require new public school teachers to complete a dyslexic screening and intervention professional development course, and would also require each school district to establish a structured literacy certification process for teachers, providing instruction in grades K through five. Um, the end goal of that, which would be kind of rolled out phases, would be to have at least one certified teacher per 100 K through five students by the end of the year, 2024-25, uh, by the end of that school year. Thank you. Sure. On to seven, public participation. Two people. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing. All right. Moving right along. On to reports. Uh, start with the superintendent's uh, report. Do we want to okay. make a motion to amend the agenda to enter into an executive session pursuant to one 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 two one point two two, uh, and we'll have that at the end of the, the meeting. And this is for uh, consider the appointment, employment, dismissal, discipline, promotion, demotion, compensation of a public employee or official, or an investigation of charges or complaints against a public employee, official, and licensee. <laughs>
over there brought in some veterans to be speakers uh, to, to the class that's in from everything in my walk around today that kids and teachers really enjoyed that and made a big impact on the kids so I heard that it was wonderful. As usual, it, they also did a program at the middle school and they opened up the day by recognizing veterans and had them stand up and be recognized for the contributions and the students were there. I heard that that was a really good program. I didn't make it for that, unfortunately, because we got some things here at the high school. But tomorrow, uh, traditionally, we have our peer leadership group that will go over and serve lunch to the veterans. And that's been a tradition that Christy Edmondson and our peer leadership team usually does for the veterans. So, as we know, we wouldn't be sitting in these chairs tonight if it hadn't been for our veterans, and that's just a wonderful event that uh, we want to make sure that we're paying our respects to veterans and for all that they did. So, I just want to make sure that we're recognizing that as a board and as a school district. Do they serve the lunch now? That's at Open Door every year. That's uh, where the Open Door <coughs> opens their doors to the veterans and has our group come over and bring the meals over there. And so, so they have a pretty nice lunch for that group, for the veteran group. So that's uh, first. Um, the next item that I have, which is the item that I had written here, was supervision athletic events. I just want to bring this up tonight and start to talk about it and I'm not expecting, I'm not recommending anything at this point or asking you to make any kind of decisions, but we, other schools have done this and it's something that we just maybe need to talk about and discuss a little bit and that's uh, for the lower grade students in some stadiums for football games, they're asking that supervision of those students become mandatory. Parents need to take the kids up till sixth grade in the stands with them, basically, and not just drop them off and let them to have free run of the stadium. Honestly, uh, we've talked about this as a board through the years that I've been here as superintendent, and we've always made the decision, let, let make sure that the kids have fun and this should be an enjoyable event but from my observation I think that this is getting progressively more difficult for everybody and we've been having a few incidences almost every game every football game and it, it, it's getting to the point where it seems like the kids are just getting a little bit out of hand and then they're ruining the experience for other people that are there to enjoy the game. And some of the time has to be taken by staff, by parents, by spectators that are unfortunately the, at the outskirts of these incidents that are taking place. Last game we had a, a fight actually that took place that disrupted some of the people that were there and just caused chaos. And it was involving kids that were actually sixth grade so just something to think about and talk about if we are going to do this I think we need to start thinking about it and planning it early enough and giving parents enough time to know that they can't just any longer drop their students off and just purchase a ticket to the game and let their kid come to the game and then they pick them up after the game and I think that that's what's happening in a lot of cases they're just dropping them off and expecting that they're going to behave and there's no supervision. And I know that for a fact that this is being done in, in a few stadiums around us and it seems like it's becoming the trend because of the same reason. So it's something for us as a board and as a district to think about. We don't have to just decide tonight that that's what we're going to do, but we just want to be sure that people are there to enjoy the game and that's their first and foremost reason to be there is to watch the game not just to run around everywhere and um, just my thoughts on it and my observations and talking to our administrative team about the issues and it's just becoming more and more of a concern. 
we have an issue with the kids putting the football around down in the one grassy area? Yeah, and that's another thing. We, we hire auxiliary police. We usually have, I believe, five on at a game. And the police do a decent job of that, but before you know it, the kids are right back at it again. So they tell them, and then they go back to it. Believe it or not, they're not even listening to the police officers when they're telling them to do something. So if they're with their parents, they won't have an option if, if that's what we might think about doing. And right now, too, we've, it, we've added a spirit booth in the area that the kids usually play football. And that's disruptive to them selling over there because people are walking over there in that spirit booth. Kids are throwing a ball around. Inadvertently, the ball gets thrown too far. Kids are running. They're not paying attention. It's, it's an accident waiting to happen for someone that might be in the area of that spirit booth and get hurt because kids are playing. Can we also have the, uh, the, brick, the brick area? With, uh, is that with we took it down oh. for that reason, honestly. Uh, those bricks, those brick, there was a V by the anchor. And every year our maintenance people have had to put that back together. And it's not just every year, it's after every game. I just finally said, hey guys, let's just take this down. Because it, that's just been a congregating place for kids and it's not necessarily because they're, they're not with parents. They're walking all over the bricks. They're knocking them down. So we just took it down or planting seagrass around the anchor. And that's just more appropriate because irregardless of whether or not the kids were there, most likely people sit on that. They, they don't do it on purpose, but that really, it was hard to maintain. It was just one of those items that probably were better off not to have. It looked nice when it was first put up, but it, it's just something that was too hard to maintain. So we've, we've taken that down. One of the things that James did recently too is he got pricing to, on the home side, fence in under the bleachers. And we're still getting more quotes. So I'll come back to you with those quotes. One of the things that we talked about it was blocking with a piece of plywood the underside of the bleachers because what we do is we have kids that go behind those bleachers and they sit and they want to look up underneath the stands and it, it's just it's not it is lit back there but not well lit as we'd like it to be and it becomes a a, a problem for us of, of supervising kids once again so we're thinking about at the very minimum at least putting plywood there so they can't sit way up underneath the stands, but we're also thinking to run the fence back a little bit and just fence that whole area off. And it could be used then partially during the winter time for things that would be stored outside as storage that might be worthwhile for us if we can buy the fencing at a decent price and not pay a whole lot to get that fenced in. And that might solve a problem. And it wouldn't look bad. We'd make sure that it was done like in a black, not just chain link, but a little bit nicer fencing and so, so like close off the walking back, access there'd still be walking access along the back where it's well lit but it would be just a path then to get from one end to the other so just the up close part of it. that's right Maybe so you'd still be able to use the two exits right. out of the bleachers that's that are in right. the middle yes okay and then maybe like 10, ten foot up up to that section and then there'd still be an exit to go back out okay. of but it just wouldn't be a congregating place as it is now for for kids. Could this be just football? Well, it, it's it's. For whatever you, you mean for uh, for the seating with your parents? Oh. And you know, sixth and yeah, you know, basketball say, or just football or volleyball or. Well, we don't really have that problem for basketball else? because basketball is more of a controlled inside place, and we don't really have kids that we see that are just dropped off running around. That's true. It seems to be more controlled, but I would say that, it, and soccer is a little bit different because there are more just people there that are to see the games, and mm -hmm. it's just a different atmosphere. But if it might be a, a band concert or something similar to that, we would say the same thing, possibly. But it's just something to think about tonight, and maybe I'll bring it up in an, another month or two as a as a discussion item. 
then we can talk about it and see what your thoughts are, but I just didn't want to include it as, as a beginning to plant a thought in your mind about what to do in the future. Could we maybe ask um, other districts around if, sort of see what their rules are or see sure. what they have? Yeah, I know for sure Avon, 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 yeah. Avon Lake, yeah, they they've went to that yeah. same policy. Avon, you have to be accompanied by an adult to That's get in, right? right. Mm -hmm. yeah. For sixth grade and under, is that how they get in there? Yes. Yeah. Exactly. So it's just something to think about. Okay, that's all I have for that item. And the next item that I have on here is to recommend a resolution to approve the agreement for consultation and support services between Vermillion School District and Positive Education PEP at a cost of $57,750 for 70 days, commencing November of 2019 and ending in June of 2020. I'll move. Second. So let me tell you a little bit about this and what this is for. We're, we're working in our school district to have a continuum of service for students that are having social and emotional learning issues. And this seems like an expensive program, but I can tell you that our district has done a pretty good job of not sending kids to a self-contained PEP unit. What this is, is a program that they come to us and work with us and give us a training it's a teacher management program basically that will help our teachers to work with some students that are having some higher needs that are usually emotionally lear emotional learning based type deficiencies and uh, so this is part of that program this is paid through uh, through our basically our free and reduced lunch program. It, it's part of the health and wellness, uh, student wellness, not health and wellness, student wellness program. And we received this year based on our free and reduced count. Actually, this is a year behind. So the funds that we received are $240,000. Next year, we're already slated to make uh, a significant amount more money because as you know, our free and reduced lunch count has been increasing and uh, so that's where the money is coming for, from to pay for these and one of the requirements is that you, you have to then well, I'll get to that on the next item but uh, and I'll say a little bit more about that in the next item but that's where the money is coming from for, for this program and I think that this is a part of our whole wraparound idea here where we're providing services for students that are in need and helping our teachers to get the, the training and the help that's needed to work with the students so i just wanted to give a pretty this this says it provides consultation and support does it is it in the form of a person in the school yes. buildings or yes so they actually have people from pep come to us it's a pep assist so they're bringing the people to us. PEP also does have a, a self-contained self program in itself where you would send kids from our district out to that program and they're no longer with us then. They're still considered our student, but you enroll them in that program and that's significantly more expensive. One student runs can run in the $50,000 range just for one student to be there. So this assistance is actually going to provide services for uh, for the district for that number of days and the teachers and the, and the kids. Any questions about that? Or? Can I call the roll, please? Ms. Russell? Yes. Step? Yes. Mr. Stern? Yes. Ms. Innes? Yes. Mr. Hayden? Yes. Motion approved 5-0. <coughs> Excuse me. All right, so the third item on my report is to recommend a resolution to approve the agreement between Ohio Guidestone and Vermillion Local School District for school-based behavioral health consultation 
and a prevention program at a rate of $114.36 per hour for purchase services. And it's in attachment B. I'll move. Okay, so some more information about this. Same fund that this is coming out of, it's, paid, it's coming from that free and reduced wellness program and it's part of the $240,000 that the district received. And this is part of what the community asked for us back in March of 2018 when we were looking at how to work with families and the whole, whole child and the social and emotional learning aspect of a child. And so this is part of a three-pronged program, really, that, that is the total wraparound aspect and continuing of, continuum of services. Guidestone is this type of a program that will provide up to 20 sessions for 10 students. And it's, it's a consultation service, basically, and a and guidance service beyond what our counselors are offering. Our counselors can do a whole lot, but there's more things that can be done for students and families that are having issues. So um, this really is for Erie County students only. The, the students that are in Lorraine County get paid through the, uh, the Lorraine Mental Health Board, actually. So this is a different funding source that we get the money for this. and. Um, you have to partner with an outside agency. This Guidestone is considered a partnership with an outside agency that we need to do to be eligible to spend the funds properly that we get audited for, and it's, it's just part of what we're doing. I can say this about the things that we're doing. Uh, we're not perfect by any means of things that we're doing in our school district, but I think that we have a lot to be proud of when our teachers and our families go out and our community goes out and they talk about what's happening with what we're doing with our, with our programming to provide students with help. We're being told by outside people outside of our school district that you need to come over and watch what Vermillion is doing right now in this regard. Honestly, we don't feel that way sometimes because there's still things that in the process aren't working and we're still not helping students enough in our estimation. And it's not that our teachers don't want to or they don't care or they're not trying. There's a lot of caring, there's a lot of empathy, there's a lot of work going on, but there's still things that irregardless of the fact that we have all these great things like this in place and we put it all together and we packaged it and we made it a type of a wraparound service, there's still more work to be done. And there's more kids that are coming to us with greater needs, quite honestly. And uh, it's a challenge. But this program is what is a piece of that puzzle that we're working to put together and we're proud of what's happening here and what, what we're doing. Just to piggyback off that too, um, the funding that, that Mr. Pemberton is speaking of here is, is from House Bill 166 that Governor Wine signed into law effective October 17th of this year. Um, all of this money that we'll be receiving, all school districts in Ohio will be receiving, um, is not the general fund dollars. It's, it's a 400 fund from the state of Ohio, and it's a restricted, uh, not an unrestricted grant. So the money that we are receiving from the state can only be spent on like six different things, and these, these are part of it. Mr. Stark? Yes. Mr. Hayden? Yes. Ms. Russell? Yes. Ms. Innes? Yes. Motion approved 5-0. Okay, one last item that I don't have on this. We just received word today that we received a innovative strategies for improving college and career readiness uh, for students with disabilities grant. And it's a two-year grant, and we received $50,000 for the first year. 75,000 for the second year. And once again, this grant was applied for by our staff, Melissa Wagner, 
Cindy Akers uh, helped to write this, Karen Blackburn, uh, Jim Bellotta. We all worked together to make sure that this got in and got uh, posted and included the type of information that's needed. Uh, this has got some pretty really neat things that are going to be attached to it. Uh, there's four components to it, a family support meeting, component, a parent center, a business partnership, and some inclusive extracurricular activities. Uh, so we'll be creating a parent center over at Ritter Library that will be connected to our parents. Uh, we'll be holding some extra parent workshops for students that have disabilities. Uh, we'll be creating some more business partnerships. And one of the really cool things that talk to Karen about today that I think is going to be pretty amazing is that they're creating a, a new type of extracurricular activity that really follows OHS AA rules and this is just going to be like a like our basketball team they'll form a basketball team that has to have at least three students with disabilities but has to have and this is just to field a team of five for example this is not the only ratio that you would have and you'd have uh, three students with disabilities and two regular students without disabilities that would play on a team that compete throughout the state for a state championship and they actually then compete outside of the state and it's not just for basketball it's for flag football for soccer uh, it, it, does, it can be for drama for example we can hire a a student that has had disabilities but can be a coach themselves that wants to coach kids in drama and have for example mrs brown at the middle school that has done the drama in the past she could be the co-coach with a, a student that has disabilities that would be a coach along with her coaching the drama uh, department at the middle school something to that effect so there's lots of different options with this grant that they've got and we were uh, this was a competitive process and we were selected for it based on the ideas that we had going into this and I think that's not I think I know that this is going to be a great enhancement to our district and part of the whole package of what we're doing for kids and it's an, it's an inclusive model it's not like you, we all have heard of the Special Olympics. This is really now a, a new phase of Special Olympics that goes beyond Special Olympics. It, it's making teams to, to be inclusive and not just say, those are the specially, special needs people. These are people working together with everybody and it can be done. That's great. Congratulations. So yeah. that's all I have on my report for tonight. Okay. On to the treasures. <laughs> all right. So, uh, recommend a resolution to approve the financial report for October 31st, 2019. That's attachment C. So, um, I'll second. Um, so taking a look here, we're going to look at revenue first uh, through the month of October the district received 10.5 million in general fund revenue compared to 10.3 fiscal year 19 10.5 18 and 10.5 again in 17 so again we're, we're right on pace revenue wise with where we've been in years past moving on to the food service fund through the month of October uh, we've received $113,779 compared to 158,000 in fiscal year 19, 192,000 in fiscal year 18, and 158,000 in fiscal year 17. Uh, and the reason for that is, is we did not receive reimbursement from school nutrition program in July or August uh, because we did not sell any lunches. Historically, we received June payments during the month of July, and the school started also prior to Labor Day, so we didn't have anything. It, it just, it, it's basically just a change in our schedule here. And so our food service revenue should be on pace with last year's collections once we have time to catch up here. Uh, 
when we look at all funds by revenue, through the month of October, we received 13.9 million in all funds, compared to 10.6 in fiscal year 19, 11.4 in fiscal year 18, and 11.3 in fiscal year 17. And the reason for this revenue in fiscal year 20, the reason it appears to be so much higher than other years is because of the transfer of nearly $2 million. Uh, earlier on in the year, I ended up transferring approximately 1.9, some uh, 1.99 million from the uh, 016 fund and just moving it over to the 001 fund. Basically, we used to have two checkbooks, and I just created one checkbook. Um, and so when you do that, it shows up as a transfer, which inflates your revenue a little bit, and it will also show as a decrease on the expenditure side when we get to it. So right now, we're overinflated by $2 million, and we'll be overinflated on the expenditure side as well. But um, you know, you subtract $2 million from there, we're, we're right there at 11.9, which is right in line with what we've been in years past as well. Taking a look at expenditures through the month of October, uh, we've expended 8.3 million in the general fund, compared to 7.3 uh, million last year, 7.6 million the year before, and 7.7 fiscal year 17. Uh, the district currently on, pay, on pace to spend a little bit more than it did in the previous three fiscal years, and this can be attributed to higher negotiated salary costs, uh, increases to health and dental insurance, and also hiring additional intervention specialists. Looking at expenditures on the food service portion, through the month of October, we've expended $247,000 in the food service fund, compared to $151,000 in fiscal year 19, $241,000 in fiscal year 18, and $202,000 in 17. And the reason we have, again, higher uh, expenditures here, we've coded additional salaries toward food service and purchase services, um, and we've also purchased additional capital for the cafeterias. So, we're dipping into that savings account that we had, and again, that was the plan all along, was to bring our, our overall food service expenditure fund down to a more manageable level here. 18, that was, we had, ex, we had equipment there, probably? In 241? Um, yeah, I would assume so. Um, a lot of this stuff, I mean, a lot of it's just timing when we hit these things. Uh, the, the major things that we've done this year, though, we're making a concerned effort to not have that much cash in food service if we can have the ability to offset it with expenditures from the general fund. And so things that we would typically in the past maybe buy out of the general fund, we're buying the food service money. Yeah, okay. yeah the ovens, we purchased ovens yeah. and yeah. a dishwasher. We were yeah. just replacing the dishwasher at the high school, okay. which is pretty hefty. Which is way more expensive than I thought it was. Yeah. <laughs> yeah so. Um, moving on to all funds by expenditure through the month of October, we've expended 13.9 million from all funds compared to 10.6 million last year, 11.8 in fiscal year 18, and 11.1 in fiscal year 17. And again, as I said before, on the revenue side, you're seeing this increase in expenditures be good by $2 million. And then lastly, we're going to look at cash. Um, this will make more sense and be more accurate with numbers, whether we see the inflated $2 million and the you know, This will the true test right here. Um, through October, the district has a total of $18.3 million in cash, compared to $17.6 last year, $16.8 in fiscal year 18, and $16.7 in fiscal year 17. Uh, with the food service through October, we have a total of $243,975 in cash and food service compared to $306,626 last year, $218,997 in fiscal year 18, and $175,602 in fiscal year 17. And then when we take a look at all of our cash combined um, through the month of October, we have a total of $21.9 million in cash from all funds, compared to $21.0 million in fiscal year 19, $20.3 million in fiscal year 18, and 20.2 million in fiscal year 17. And then lastly, we're gonna take a look at the investment side of things. Uh, through the month of October, we've earned a total of $128,487.55 on interest, compared to $110,404.65 uh, this time last year. Uh, this is a difference of $18,082.90, over 14.07% more in revenue on investments. Any questions? Cool. 
Ms. Innes? Yes. Mr. Habermill? Yes. Mr. Stark? Yes. Ms. Russell? Yes. Ms. Stapp? Yes. Motion approved 5 0. Uh, number two, recommend a resolution to accept the following donations. $6,092 from VABC to the softball program. Uh, $1,635.10 from BNN to athletics. And $5,000 from Ron Lashinsky and Denise Ross to athletics. scores and stuff in and right. I think it's the money you make back through the through, through advertising, advertising or whatever. Oh, okay. I think it's the company that hosts Vermillion Athletics. It's Say that whole again, Sean? the whole the website Vermillion Athletics. It's that hosting company. Okay. So they must sell ads or something and then Justin for the really generous five thousand dollar mm -hmm. donation from Ron Ron Lashinsky. Mm -hmm. We fixed that for the record, though it's L E S, not L A S. Yes, we can. Can we pay E for five thousand dollars? Can we buy E? Nice. We are. Okay. Miss Russell. Yes. Miss Stapp. Yes. This is. Yes. Mr. Stark? Yes. Mr. Hayden? Yes. Motion approved 5-0. Uh, number three, recommend a resolution to approve the payment from the basketball donation fundraiser fund to the following for helping with boys and girls basketball. Um, Cody Rice for $400 for keeping stats for boys basketball program and also $300 for filming all the way girls basketball games. To Brett Colahan, $300 for filming all away games for boys basketball games. <coughs> to Cameron Kuhn, $500 for helping with the boys basketball program. To Jerry Western, $1,000 for keeping statistics, handling or handing the score scorebook, and also uh, coordinating the youth program for the girls basketball program. sent this over in one of the Friday packets with some language here just explaining a little bit more but ultimately um, what Phil was talking about earlier that student wellness and success fund that's the 467 fund that you see below for $241,460 on your change from September mm -hmm. um, we had to basically add that to the appropriation so we can spend money out of that fund um, Everything from the general fund all the way down until the 300 district managed activity, there's no change from the September appropriations. And then we did change, uh, I'm making a recommendation to change the auxiliary services. We're going to get a little bit more money in, in that fund for the uh, same areas. Um, we had just recovered or gone over the 467 fund, the student wellness, which is an issue of House Bill 166. And then just recently, I received our budgets for our federal programs, that are, which are all the 500 funds. And so all I did was take my estimate, my low estimate from July, and then put in the new budget. So you're seeing the change from September, for example, from IEA 
from $100,000 and then adding 326,689 dollars for a total of 426,689. And again, these are all reimbursements that we'll be receiving from the federal government. Um, and on the last page, again, this is just us. Um, I just summed everything up for you to show that the certificate of estimated resources, which is our available cash, exceeds our appropriation amount and the difference that we're leaving behind there. So again, really the only change from September is just to tidy things up and a little bit of house cleaning items there. Call the roll. Um, Mr. Hagerman. Yes. Ms. Russell. Yes. Ms. Stepp. Yes. Mr. Stark. Yes. Ms. Sims. Yes. Motion approved 5-0. Move. Sarah. Sarah. Stark. Yes. Ms. Stepp. Yes. Ms. Russell. Yes. Mr. Hagerman. Yes. Ms. That was it. All right. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Next item, item nine, items for discussion. Anything? Oh, wait. Um, that was not it. It's okay. I would also like to do a forecast. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I just said nothing. Yeah. We were all going to roll past it, too. <laughs> yeah, I've been calling a special meeting. That's that. uh, can we also <laughs> add number five? Recommend a resolution to approve the, five, uh, the November 2019 five-year forecast. I'll move. That's second. So the purpose of the five-year forecast, again, it's, it's to engage the Board of Education and the community in long-range planning and discussions of financial issues facing the school district. And for example, you know, this is where we discuss or to make everybody aware of the renewal levy coming up. Um, we also want this to serve as a basis for determining the school district's ability to sign contracts associated with continued operations. Um, and when we look at this stuff, this will be the uh, this will be the fund balance at the bottom of the forecast when we get to it. And then this also is to provide a method for the Department of Education and the Auditor of State to identify school districts with potential financial problems. Uh, the way that they use this five-year forecast is they will take a look at it and identify any negative fund balances within the first two years, more importantly, but they're also looking long-term at the five years. So to break a five-year forecast down, uh, it's easier to take a look at it with two sides of revenue. We have local revenue, and then we have state revenue. On the local revenue side, that's your property taxes. Local property taxes account for 70.9% of the district's revenue. Uh, property values are just above where they were in 2008 before the market crash. Uh, property tax collection rates were 7% higher than average in 2019 and 3.9% higher on delinquent accounts. So we're seeing an uptick in the amount of revenue that we're getting from local taxes, really just because um, we're collecting a lot more delinquents and we're having people pay a lot more on time as well. Um, and then lastly here, property tax revenue has increased by 1.8% in the last five years. And believe it or not, it's actually decreased 1.3% in the last 10 years. Here's a quick look at our historical property values. You know, when we were talking about before the market crash in 2008, there you are just below $460 million. And then fast forward <coughs> to 2012, we bottomed out down there just, just below 420000 And since 2014, we've slowly been inching our way back up. Um, looking at some of the, the trends and the projections, uh, I anticipate that, that to continue on its trajectory right now. And we should be, actually just now in 19, we've, we've now surpassed where we were in 20, uh, 2008, which is a good thing. And this is kind of addictive of that chart if you take a look at it. Here's the historical property tax collections. Back in 2011, we collected $18.4 million. 
and then fast forward to 2014, 16,300 or 16.3 million. That's almost a, that's a little over two million dollar drop, and that that effect is really just from delinquent property taxes. Uh, you can see in the upcoming years, 2015, 16, 17, 18, 19. We're starting to get back up to where our average is, right around that 17.3 million. Now we take a look at state funds. So state funds, they show up two different ways. They show up in restricted, which is what Phil was speaking of. And then they also show up as unrestricted, where we can spend that money on anything that we need. Uh, restricted grants, cash off of cost reimbursement, economic disadvantage, career tech funding, and also newly included is the, but it's not in the five to forecast, but newly included uh, student wellness and success funds. On the unrestricted side, these are funds received through the state foundation program with no restrictions. Uh, districts receive 19.6% of its revenue from this source and is currently on the guarantee uh, foundation funding formula. So the state share index is used to determine a district's capacity to raise local revenue when determining state funds. The basis for this calculation is the district's three-year average property value, median income tax, and wealth index. In fiscal year 19, Vermillion received 26.9% of the opportunity grant, which equates to $1,624 per student. And just for a comparison's sake, in fiscal year 17, the state share index is 28.7, which equated to 1720. So what's that saying? When we're seeing our property tax, our, our property valuation increase, our property value is increasing, which is reducing our valuation per pupil. Or I should say increasing our valuation per pupil. Mm -hmm. And because of that, the state's saying, well, Vermillion, you're a little bit more wealthy, so we're going to give you a little bit less cash, and we're going to rely on the <coughs> local uh, population to, to subsidize you. Now, again, because we're on, a, on the uh, guarantee even though our state share index has decreased, we'll still collect roughly the same amount of revenue that we always have. Um, one of the things that makes this forecast a little bit tricky, though, is that this is going to cover two biennials from governors. Uh, they could rewrite the language and take that out. Uh, it's hard to say. Right now, we collect about 1.4 million on that guarantee. So if that were to be changed or to be rewritten, we would lose $1.4 million from the state. I don't think that's going to happen, but you never know. This is just an interesting thing to go over. Um, in there, I put our fiscal year, the amount of students that we have enrolled, our state revenue, and the dollar change and the percent change. And this is including all of our state aid. So in 2014, we had 1,905 students, and we collected $4.6 million. Next year, 2015, we, we had a little less students, but we collected $5 million. Next year went through 2016, we lost students again, now to 1844, and we dropped in revenue, 4.8. Since then, it's been pretty, pretty consistent at 4.8, 4.6, 4.7. Um, things have bottomed out a little bit. Uh, things down in Columbus have stabilized a little bit. We're not changing the formula as much as we were in those years past, and, and you're able to see that in the reflection of the 4.8 roughly a billion dollars. From 2020 on, I've projected our enrollment um, continuing that slight decline that we've had. And then I've also projected the state revenue, again, because we're on the guarantee and because uh, we saw a large uptick in House Bill 166. That's our total state revenue. So going forward, the reason you're seeing that extra $200,000 in there is because, like Phil said, we, we we gained $241,000. And then it's actually going to go up to $330,000 in fiscal year 2021. And then we kind of bottom out from there because that far out, it's incredibly difficult to forecast what's, what the legislation is going to do at that point in time. Taking a look at all other operating revenues. This is a revenue it accounts for 9.1% of the district's revenue. It includes things like tuition, transportation, interest on investments, uh, sale of assets, payment in lieu of taxes, and Medicaid reimbursements. Um, tuition from other school districts whose students attend our schools as well as from open enrollment. 
Uh, this line is estimated to decrease by approximately 15% over the course of the forecasted period. And the reason I'm forecasting that decrease is basically due to space. This year we weren't able to accept as many open enrollment students uh, as we had in years past, and the main reason for that was just space. And so that decrease in student um, population also decreased our the amount of money we received from the state. Here again is our historical and our forecasted revenue for total revenue. As you can see in 2019, we're at $24.3 million. Um, We've had some pretty good collection rates this year with our taxes, so that's an optimistic number there at that 24.5 million that we'll be collecting this year. And then from there, because we've collected over 100%, uh, we brought it back down to where our average collection rate. So when you pay taxes in school districts, uh, we typically collect 96.5% of the revenue. In 2020 and in the fiscal year uh, 2019, we actually collected over 100%. And so in order for us to, I wouldn't want to project us always going <coughs> over 100% in our taxes, as much as I'd like to. Moving on to the expenditure side, uh, the major thing, the first thing that we always take a look at is the, the personnel services. This is our largest expenditure. This accounts for 49.1% of total expenditures. And this consists of employees' salaries and wages. It also includes any extended time, any severance pay, any supplemental contracts, and any overtime. Uh, personal services have remained fairly flat despite historical negotiated salary increases. Uh, however, this time around, uh, and again, those, uh, those flat salaries were due to attrition. Uh, however, we're anticipating the increase since the last round of negotiations, and I put that on here as well. You can see we, we kind of ebb and flow as far as our historical and our forecasted personnel services go. Um, 2019 to 2020, that was our large year for our negotiated contracts. And then from there, they should stay fairly flat. They're not going to increase at a 5% at a rate since we have uh, negotiated agreements in place for three years. But again, this does count for the uh, increase in the board pay pension side. This does show also uh, uh, step increases as well. Our next largest item here is employee benefits. Um, so again, this is going to be your retirement. This is going to be insurance benefits. Uh, this accounts for 19.4 percent of the budget, and it's forecasted to increase over the next five years. This consists of retirement for all employees. This this includes workers' compensation, early retirement incentives, Medicare unemployment costs and also everything health related. Um, so this year we actually received a 5% increase in our medical insurance premiums. And in health insurance premiums forecasted throughout the next five years, I've included a 5% increase. I'm trying to, trying to predict what our health insurance costs are going to be or how much they're going to rise in the next two, three, four, five years. It's pretty difficult to do. Uh, industry standard says anywhere between 5 and 6%. Uh, so that's where I kept it at. Um, one interesting thing though, we did receive a premium holiday this year, this fiscal year, and as we've also received discounts on our workers' compensation because we're a drug-free campus, we've received a discount for going green and another discount for going five years or more without a late payment. It's less than 1%, but you know, very big counts there. Yeah. What does it mean to go green? Uh, I, go, I go paperless. Okay. I just you have to like that. show some kind of a... So it's all done through the Bureau of Workers' Compensation. Instead of getting a bill all the time, I just click the button to say go green and say Gotcha, okay. Yeah. Gotcha, okay. And believe it or not, our, our, our benefits have stayed fairly flat. And again, it's, it's, it's based on um, single plans are, are less expensive than family plans and, and vice versa there. Um, but as you can see, starting in 2020, we started with the baseline, and I increased it 5% each year uh, just to be on the conservative side there. Our next largest line item is purchase services. These account for 18.6% of our uh, expenditures. This is stuff like tuition paid to external providers. This is our utilities. This is services for operation, tuition expenses for scholarships, community schools, and open enrollment out. And I put the numbers up there 
just so you can see what they are. But the district pays out $611,284 in fiscal year 19 for open enrollment out. We also pay $151,163 in communities. We also pay $67,100 in scholarship transfers. And we also pay $376,597 to the ESC. So when you add all this stuff up, this totals $1.2 million in students funding transferred out. That's a big portion of our purchase services there. And again, purchase services also have been flow. Sometimes we provide services in-house. Sometimes we seek the ESC out to get those services. It just depends on the number of students that we have for certain programs. And then uh, I put a 3% increase on our purchase services starting in 2020. Again, just, just for um, typically what we're doing is we're hiring employees uh, to, to cover things or to have our utilities and those things, you know, on average are going to go up around 3%. So one of the main things that we always want to look at in our forecast is line 6.010. Again, this shows our revenue over our expenditures. This is able to get a good sense of the school district's fiscal health. If you're always spending more money than you're bringing in, that line right there will tell you and, and you know that you're going to have to make some changes. So a positive number indicates that the school district spent within its revenue for that fiscal year, <coughs> and a negative number indicates that the district's expenditures exceeded the revenue generated for that fiscal year, resulting in a reduction to any surplus the district holds. So the red line is our expenditures, and the blue line is our revenue. Right now, we're right here. Last year, we did pretty well. But over here, that was, I believe, when we, uh, we had a big move from the old building over here. We had a bunch of uh, purchase services and movie expenses that we had to capture. As you can see, when we did that, we, we, we spent significantly more money than we brought in. Uh, looking at the future, again, our, our revenue, it's driven by two things. It's driven by taxes and it's driven by the number of students that we have. We, in the next five-year forecast here, we're just planning on a renewal levy. And we don't plan on bringing in a bunch more students to make an offset on our revenue. So our revenue is going to be flat. But as you've seen, you know, we have 5% increases on health insurance. We have step schedules to go through the salaries. We have increases to purchase services. So over time, our expenditures are going to keep increasing. That's where it's Phil and I's job to take a look at this stuff and see what we can do to make sure that what you're seeing in 2024 doesn't happen. And then here's our forecast at a snapshot. Uh, last year, actual revenue, 24.3 million. Actual expenditures, 22.9 million. Results of operation, $1.3 million to the positive. This year, uh, 24.5 million is our estimated, our forecasted revenue. 24.3 million is our forecasted expenditures. Results of operation, positive $200,000. 2021, again, it starts getting a little more challenging to, to pin that down, but it looks like it's gonna be, uh, assuming we kept everything as, as we did today, uh, we would more than likely be overspending in 2021, 2022, 2023, and 2024, and so on. One of the main things to look at is our beginning cash balance at 16.018907. If we were to continue this path and we didn't renew our levy in 2024, we'd be down to just under a million dollars. Uh, with our fund balance, I included our renewal levy. We starting off at uh, 15.7 million in 2020, and by the end of the forecasted period, we're 11.3 million. So we dropped a little over a little over four million dollars. So final comments here, I mean, overall today the district is still in good financial health. Um, however, a couple of things to keep an eye on. The district's going to need to watch its spending carefully so it can mirror revenues. We don't want to have higher expenditures than we have revenues for as long as we possibly can. And uh, also as costs continue to rise, the district will need to find additional ways to reduce expenditures, increase its revenue, or do a combination of both. That's it. Any questions?
<laughs> For sure. All right, thank you. Um, moving on to item nine, items of discussion. Oh, we're voting on that now. Yeah. Um, unless there are any questions. No, 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 I forgot to do the resolution. Yeah. All right, uh, Mr. Hayden. Yes. Ms. Russell. Yes. Ms. Scott. Yes. Mr. Stark. Yes. Ms. Ennis. Yes. Motion approved 5 0. Now, no. items for discussion. They're not the term. Anything? All right. Moving on then. Uh, item 10, recommend a resolution to move into executive session for the purpose of appointment, employment, dismissal, discipline, promotion, demotion, or compensation of public employees, or the investigation of charges or complaints against an employee or student unless the employer, official, or student requests a public hearing. Mm -hmm. Second. Does that go to spoil them? Yeah. For executive sessions? Yeah. Okay. Because for each thing we discussed. Right, right, right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And you second it? Yeah. Hello? Ms. Innes? Yes. Mr. Hayden? No. Yes. Ms. Stepp? Yes. Mr. Stark? Yes. Ms. Russell? Yes. Motion approved 5 0. Yes. Time is 8 12. 8 12. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Do you want to time back 8 4? One of the lucky ones. Okay. Item 10, consent agenda. The superintendent and treasurer recommend that the Board of Education approve the consent agenda items. Action by the Board of Education and adoption of the consent agenda means that all items are adopted by one single motion unless a member of the board, the treasurer, or the superintendent requests that any such item be removed from the consent agenda and voted upon separately. Number one, minutes of the October 14, 2019 regular meeting, attachment D. Two, adopt revisions to the following district policies and accompanying guidelines as recommended by NEOLA, the first read as listed, attachment E. Three, adopt a resolution to approve open enrollment agreement for excess costs for children with disabilities with the Huron City School District seven students and Edison Local School District two students, attachment F. Four, approve the agreement for health center between the Vermillion Local Schools and Erie County Health Department, Erie County Community Health Center, attachment G. Five, approve the following employment action. Letter of resignation from Denise Zilski, Administrative Assistant to Operations, effective October 25th, 2019. Gabriel Caudell, teacher, effective October 2nd, 2019. Six. One year classified contract for the 2019-20 contract year to Cindy Akers, General Administrative Assist Assistant, Food Service, eight hours, $17.71 per hour. Vanessa Carter, Food Service Worker, Level 1, $11.05 per hour. Seven, one year additional duties contract for the 2019-20 contract year as listed. Eight, one year supplemental contract for the 2019-20 contract year to as listed. Nine, one year non-union contract for the 2019-20 contract year to Kelly Gross. OPC transfer from food service and bus monitor to central office special projects liaison. To the superintendent and treasurer, year one, step one, $26,000.05 for 169 days. And 10, one year contract extension for the 2020-2021 contract year to Phil Pepin, superintendent. Any items that need to be removed? No. No. I'll move. Or did we already move? No. <laughs> Just anything. Remove, but nothing removed. Okay, so Chris moved. That's second. Any questions or discussion on anything? Clarifications? All right, call roll, please. Ms. Stark. Yes. Uh, Mr. Stark. Yes. Ms. Innes. Yes. Mr. Abel. Yes. Ms. Russell. Yes. Motion approved 5 0. Next item public participation. John? <laughs> I do have a question. I'll do public participation. For uh, Caudill, who resigned, how did they, what, what happened to like, his class load? Is that being covered with a sub or did yeah, it we redistributed? We were lucky or? enough to find a sub that had experience doing similar work in another district. I think we he's actually subbing for us, and so we hired him in that position. I think so he's a hired employee now. Not just me. he's a hired teacher at the last board meeting, not yeah. just so, the sub. Okay, all right. So I, mean, I was yeah. so he's doing so. the three D printing. He was subbing for us in, in, in 
in the, our district, but then Good. we hired him as a full time. And he does all the technology stuff that. Yes, it's what he was doing at I think Zanesville. Right. And then his, I got married. He got married and moved up here, and wow, good fit. Wow. Yeah. He's good. Doing a good job. Yeah. Nice. We're lucky. Date and location of upcoming board meetings. Uh, regular meeting Monday, December 9th, 2019 at 7 p.m. Regular meeting Monday, January 13th, 2019 at 7 p.m. And regular meeting Monday, February 10th, 2020. There should be an organizational meeting on January. Yeah. Was it your 45? Actually, I think it also needs to be before January 10th. Mm. Like well, the organization meeting? For the organizational meeting. So if we, uh, so should we do the meeting on the seventh or the sixth? I mean, what's the reason you get for that? Power of Is it okay? Yeah, so as long as we did the week of the sixth, any time, it doesn't always have to be on the guess, but any time, six, seven, eight. But if we pulled the actual board meeting up to the 6th, then we could do it all that same day, right? Yeah. All right. Do that. Okay, so. Um, oh, sorry. Uh, the December 9th one, I, that's, I'm coming back from Florida that day. I thought I'd be able to make it, but Flight Price says that I'm not coming in until 7.30 that evening. <laughs> so, uh, you know, there's like a couple hundred dollar difference um, between when I, I thought I could get it to I don't think I land until 7.30, so I don't think I'm going to make that meeting. Yeah, yeah. I can talk on the way home from the airport. Okay. <laughs> yeah, okay. All right. Um, we want to just keep it as to the 9th end. Is everybody good? Yeah. Yes. All right, so then January 6th, 6.45 is the organizational meeting. And I think... Uh, Ohio Vice Code, I'll have to uh, have a public hearing for my tax budget for that as well. So I'll post that separately. It's the most exciting tax budget. <laughs> 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 so wait, wait, we can repeat that. So, so before the organizational meeting, I'll do a, uh, I'll do a separate meeting <coughs> for the board just for. Oh, so I just have to be there and have a tax budget. So just your own little meeting. So <laughs> for the community, yes, I really have to do that. Okay. Yep. Same, right. same to the six. I can do four. Yeah, it's only four fifteen, but I'll just do it that same day. Same day. Yeah. <laughs> I'll come and eat, eat my I'll dinner. I'll come and sit with you. <laughs> I need to ask questions about the tax budget. <laughs> All over it. All right. <laughs> uh, Text as much as we're good. Tell us the time. Yeah, I appreciate that. Thank you. <laughs> so, whatever Roman numeral is next, we're at another executive session. Reason number one. The appointment, employment, dismissal, discipline, promotion, demotion, or compensation of public employees, or the investigation of charges or complaints against an employee or student, unless the employee or official or student requests a public hearing. Yes. Mr. Stark. Yes. Mr. Stark. Yes. Mr. Stark. Yes. Motion approved by the 